drama surrounding prophesying. Jesus believed in evidence through signs, wonders, and works according to John 4 48, 14 11, which are revealed through the nature of God, and the miracles are performed by angels through God. Signs and wonders from God have been watched for since the beginning of time. During the Old Testament times, prophecies weren't only used for preaching, they were for the visualization of things to come. In Deuteronomy 6 1 2, God gave land to the Israelites, for them to experience total freedom, they were to learn and keep all his commands and statutes. And since the beginning of time, mankind has shown signs of rebellion towards restrictions. In the Old Testament, miracles were performed by many prophesiers but weren't necessarily viewed as a symbol of faith, rather, a provoking for death. I Thessalonians 5:20, only 20 or so different people worked miracles, and out of an estimated 340 or more miracles were recorded in Scripture. The reaction wasn't positive most times people hated God or prophets for the majority of them. In John 6:26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves, and were filled. The multitude followed him, but his closest disciples abandoned him with fear he would be put to death. Although Jesus had been accused of zealotry before being put on the cross, he also had been challenged intensely for miracles he performed. Evidence of his divine nature made people with an agenda for propaganda react violently towards him. Leading up to the event, Jesus felt a ton of emotions, anger, betrayal, bitterness, envied, forgotten, interrogated, overlooked, and yet he kept faith in God. Signs and wonders aren't supposed to be amplified above God's message for spiritual over physical needs. After Jesus rose from near death he confirmed gifts for those who believe. Some gifts of healing were asked from Jesus in Matthew 10 colon 7 8 and as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Mark 16 17-18, back then people kept advice and recommendations in their hearts, they had significant meaning. Alleged Myths and Raw Truths 1. Did Jesus die for our sins? Actually no. This is a myth. According to the Dead Sea Scrolls, he was accused of being a part of the Zealot organization, and charges were brought against him along with Judas and Simon. The group was against Rome but Jesus told them to love their enemies, and this meant the Romans. During this time Jesus was forced to make two decisions, Simon was for war and Jonathan was for peace. Jesus was already for peace, Jonathan told him about a certain cup, and he was given the choice of being beaten or given poison. At first, he refused the poison, and eventually, he accepted it. This meant his choice was for peace and accepting poison, instead of being for war and taking a beating. Afterward, he was placed in a cave and arose on the third day. Since he knew his death had been planned, he planned his return, and he was given aloe and myrrh by Simon to recover from the poison. After that, he and his friends moved to Rome, although when they got to Rome they were exiled he lived until 70. 2. Jesus will come back in a second coming? Actually no. This is a myth. Jesus returned from the cave after he recovered from the poison. God grants people two opportunities to remain spiritually fed. Jesus never strayed from his guidance, therefore, his second death decree came when he died the final time. Jesus' birth was his first coming, and his second coming was when he rose from near death. However, Jesus agreed to send us another comforter we could abide by, and this was overlooked for the myths. John 14 16-18, Jesus' son Jesus' justice inherited his reign. 3. The prophecy end times, great tribulation occurs in the future? Actually yes. History repeats itself and as long as sin occurs tribulations will increase. Matthew 24 21-44, Revelation 2 22. 4. Jesus will come back to avenge his and our enemies. Actually no. This is a myth. His enemies don't exist in our lifetime, he wasn't a vengeful person, and he believed you ought to forgive enemies. 5. Believers will get glorified bodies in a fantasy after life rapture? Actually no. This is a myth. Susan Black Research P.A.R. Psychological, after 25 years she concluded there is nothing verifiable through evidence an afterlife exists. Without purification, it is virtually impossible to have glorified bodies. Also, purification takes time and it won't happen overnight. 6. There are prophecies Jesus didn't fulfill? Actually no. This is a myth. He only planned to fulfill the Moses prophecies and he confirmed they were fulfilled in scripture. Luke 24 44-53 John 5:45-47, Revelation 2:22. 7. There are promised lands in Egypt or Israel. Actually, no. This is a myth. There are legally binding laws in those regions that eliminate a need to go searching for promised lands, 
never fulfilled through ancient gods. 8. Does heaven only exist in the clouds? Actually no. This is a myth. God created heaven in Africa, which was called the Garden of Eden, this means heaven has existed on earth. The belief is a spiritual term, that can only be in spirit. Egyptians believed you get to heaven by way of a ladder. 9. Does mankind judge souls? Actually no. This is a myth. The justice system judges people, and God judges souls. 10. There is a last judgment? Actually yes. Although, judgment is a continual process of humanity, just before our last slash second death decree as an individual we will be judged. You can reprove what is in the heart and soul through righteousness while living. Antichrist. Jesus said in Matthew 24 5 For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Religious have been taught Jesus will come back to avenge our and his enemies in a rapture. Matthew 5 44, scriptures refer to the Antichrist in Daniel 7 25, I John 1 colon 7, 2 colon 18 comma 22, 4 colon 3, as Jesus' enemy. For the most part, the person is mentioned in Revelation but doesn't reveal the name of who will possibly win over many of Jesus' followers. He is considered a man that is a personal enemy of Jesus who is expected to appear before the second coming of Christ. In which a battle between Christ and the Antichrist is supposed to take place. However, Christians believe God will destroy this person just before the final defeat of Satan. They believe the person will be admirable and trustworthy, but full of deception and sin. The man is supposed to take believers away from worshipping the current eternal God while pretending to be worthy of worship as a God. For decades many Christians have tried to predict who the person could be, and who is it currently, but most of which they believe could have been political figures. While the early Judea church thought Saul aka Paul was the Antichrist. According to the Dead Sea Scrolls, for the writers of Revelation which came from Ephesus, and the seer who saw visions of heaven's events. The seer was a bishop, sitting at the front of the congregation in the cathedral at Ephesus. They were influenced by Platonism, in believing what happened in heaven were occurrences that reoccurred on earth, and according to creation heaven has always existed on earth. Agrippa II, Jesus, Peter, and their fellow ministers were recorded in disguises of a vision, and Peter is another one of Simon Magus' disguises. During this time, descendants of Herod the Great were still the official heads of the mission, and Agrippa II was he who sat on the throne. The beast with the number 666 was the anti-pope, Simon Magus who was the powerful leader of the traditional party, he was also the leader of a Gnostic sect, teaching he was an incarnation of God. James, Jesus' stepbrother was head of the Jewish traditional party at the time, they wanted to convert Gentiles to Jews. Jesus' party was for peace they were the Christians, and again, Simon was for war. Jesus' party the Christians wanted to give Gentiles a new form of religion whereas they didn't have to conform to the Jewish identity. The two parties were conducting rival missions, fighting for the souls of Gentiles. The tensions between the parties were so high that each side called the other blasphemous, evil deceivers. The number 666 is the clue, to those who knew the Hebrew alphabet and the way it was used in the Gnostic monastic system out of which the Zealot movement rose. From Antichrist to Christian. Nowadays many religious believe Saul aka Paul has been misunderstood. I want to explain how Paul went from being against Christ to being a Christian, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. But, keep in mind a beast accuses, persecutes, and kills. If they don't kill they destroy your testimony to steal your self-worth. Paul said he was freeborn, as Saul, and was born in September 17 AD and was from a Jewish family in the city of Tarsus. As a youth, he was sent to a school called Gamaliel in Jerusalem, and at the age of 20, he attended school at the Qumran Monastery, of which he had come to resent the high priest Jonathan Annas and Jesus. After Saul graduated he took part in a pesher on the Habakkuk and was instructed on John the Baptist's technique of interpreting hidden scripture, he used it and found out about all the predictions of the stirring events of recent years. They were the subject of conversation in Qumran. In the documents, a prophet referred to a certain arrogant man, uttering four woes, curses, against him. It registered in Saul's mind, as a prediction of the man who was teaching such heresies that he was threatening the very existence of Judaism. The man of a lie, the bastard, the wicked priest, the anti-priest, Jesus had flouted the law amidst the whole congregation. When he declared himself to be a priest in the place of the descendant of Levi. As perceived, Jesus was a hater of Eastern celibates, known as the poor, and had broken the purity rules. As anyone who was at the center a few years before could attest, Jesus had suffered foolishly. His opponents had inflicted evil sickness of horror and taken vengeance upon his fleshly body. As perceived, Jesus' treatment was well deserved since he had attacked the teacher of righteousness, John the Baptist. And as perceived, the divine intention humbled him using a scourge, to the bitterness of the soul because he had done wickedness against his elect. It was easy for Saul to perceive that Jesus may have been against the Romans since he was always hanging with Simon aka Peter. In Damascus and Jerusalem, during three years of Saul's further education, 
he continued to attack the Christian heretics especially the leader Jesus. Saul was convinced they posed a real threat to the great work of spreading the Jewish faith among Gentiles. Allied with Boethus family of priests, Saul worked for their return to the high priesthood and looked to James in Damascus as the one who would occupy the throne of David when the kingdom came. The eager young Saul, who was under Gamaliel in Jerusalem during his last year of studies went to the council determined to prove a stumbling block, being in the East doctrine of the Western mission towards Gentiles. But there was another point of view, that the disadvantage was led by Saul himself. Palestinian practices of circumcision were alienating Gentiles who would otherwise embrace the spiritual aspects of the religion. Jesus taught the Gentiles, they could always be admitted without adopting the Jewish identity. During some time, Saul had persecuted and brought war upon the church in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. He then went entered every house looking for Jews both men and women to kill, and Saul captured many of them to throw in prison. Acts 7 57-8-1-3, Saul of Tarsus at the time traveled on a road going to Damascus. There the glory light blinded Paul, and a short time thereafter Ananias healed his sight. Ananias told Saul to be a witness unto all men of what he had seen and heard. In March, while a council meeting was being held, Saul attended the noon service in the vestry room of the Damascus buildings. During this time, the proselytes and villagers of the way, were on pilgrimage there, they sat in the congregation while their priests said prayers upon the half-roof. Jesus was permitted by the Magians to act as second of command, and on some occasions, he stood in for the priest. And so, Jesus was on duty at the service. Saul had the strongest objections to Jesus, he was neither a legitimate David nor a legitimate priest. Eagerly, Saul took his place in the congregation. When the noon hour came, as customary, part of the roof was removed allowing the sun to shine in to sense the time and reveal the priest saying his prayers from a raised platform. Saul prostrated himself with the rest of the congregation, averting his eyes to avoid the sun. Jesus knew of Saul's hostility and he spoke directly to him. The voice of Jesus spoke saying to Saul, You are persecuting me. Saul replied, You are illegitimate. Paul said this because he knew Jesus' biological father was a Roman soldier named Panthera. Jesus answered and said I am, affirming he was a full priest. He then invited Saul to come to the front part of the congregation, where he could hear the sermon. As Saul listened to Jesus, his formidable objectives about him began to dissolve. Saul recognized his state of bondage to the law and the way it was binding to others. During the days that followed Saul received instructions in the eastern part of the monastery building, the house of Judas. Ananias aka Simon took part in the instructions, and as Saul began to transfer his loyalty from the Hebrews to the Hellenists. He would soon make a distinction between the peace and war Hellenists, rejecting the latter. Simon probably was the one who gave Saul the lesson about the resurrection, which he later used as part of the accepted teaching for the less advanced members. Saul began his instructions in a state of blindness, as a novice. When Saul received full initiation into the party, that is when he saw the light of life, an expression found in the scrolls. Between 40 and 43 AD, Saul was given a revised form of education and at the end of it, he became a bishop. The following year his name was changed to Paul and he was appointed to the mission, to uncircumcised Gentiles of the West. Let's just be clear he was given the Gentile audience by Jesus, and Gentiles was where his loyalty laid as a Pharisee. The Jews wanted him killed and he believed he did no wrong, according to the customs of the Pharisees. He consciously killed over 5,000 Jews, but they could not prove anything, and eventually, he was released to the Romans. In a prayer, Apostle Paul called himself a chief sinner, but yet mercy was given to him after being a blasphemer, murderer, and persecutor. For the most part, he admitted to doing all that out of ignorance with unbelief in God. He went on to thank God in heaven for being merciful and counting him as faithful to teach the Gentiles. I Timothy 2 1-15, Since reading about Paul and writing about this discussion, I have learned more about him. It seems Paul and many Romans that lived back then suffered from inferior and superiority complexes. Having said that, I don't believe he wasn't misunderstood but clearly understood. Allegedly Paul was beheaded in Rome, Nero knew him personally and had him killed in 64 AD. He lived by the sword that he was bound by. Paul wrote the books of epistles in the New Testament, Romans, I and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, I and 2 Thessalonians, I and 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and Hebrews. Also, he founded several churches in Asia Minor and Europe. Dogmatism in Atheists and Religious Dogmatism reveals a positive attitude in matters of opinion, with an arrogant assertion of opinions as truths. It is rigid certainty about the correctness of one's views, with a refusal to consider alternatives. All of which can lead to a bitter conflict over one's interest. Religious beliefs tend to be more dogmatic than others' beliefs, and fundamentalist beliefs are the most dogmatic. According to researchers of the Global Terrorism Index, religion is the main force behind terrorist attacks. 
the number of deaths due to terrorism increased by 60% from 2013 to 18,000 in 2014, by 2017 those numbers had tripled. The researchers compared atheists to religious, the distinctions determined complex ideas and unconventional preferences should be of more concern for religious, to be somewhat relatable to atheists. Although dogmatism has been associated with levels of openness to experience one's interest in new and non-traditional ideas. Religious fundamentalists prefer experiencing openness with well-informed congregates, which makes their tolerance low in experiencing openness with atheists. In any case, either side wants to be right, and neither atheist nor religious tend to like disagreements. When religious disagree with atheists' concepts and opinions it can form intense situations. Conflicts often never get resolved surrounding religion since the traditional mythical themes of the Bible took place during the Gospel period which was the final extension. If you are known for being a dogmatic person, it is wise to research topics of interest both false and truths, before making misleading statements. Also, create a platform to share your opinions of true discernment after you do the research. It doesn't need to be on the platform where the conflict took place. The disagreements will continue until change comes. Contradicting Science for Religious Beliefs During the 19th century, it was the prevailing view of modernists and scientists that human reason was infallible in scientific deductions and that sciences such as chemistry, mathematics, physics, etc., was the absolute truth. And during the 20th century, the assumed immutability of the scientific laws and the concept of the absolutism of science was replaced with the principle of interminism. Meaning nothing is certain in science only relative or probable, and scientific findings are presented with considerable reservation. Limited and temporary validity, and likely to be replaced at any time by more advanced theories. Scientists and religions have been contradicting one another since the early 1500s. The conflicts will continue because both have different concepts and reasons for determining facts. But if scientists can change their beliefs of dogmatic thinking, then religious can too. Scientist findings bring about a relative or probable principle that changes people. While religious beliefs were brought about with mythical or spiritual aspects that changes people. Facts to consider. 1. Creation and human existence, while Earth is about 4.54 billion years old, the first animal life dates at least 3.5 billion years ago. The first animal life was formed from the Earth's natural resources, which is creation and evolution. People share 95% of their DNA with chimps. It is believed the first human apes were discovered in Ethiopia and lived 4.4 million years ago. 2. The world is billions of years old and man evolved through a process of evolution. The Bible says the first man was Adam. But its name was Arti, short for Artipithecus Ramatus. Australopithecus hominids is the oldest known ancestor of humans, they originated from the southern apes of Old Ove Gorge in Tanzania. They lived between 4 to 1 million years ago and were human creatures. And there is only one human race, with multiple sub-races. Dictionary terms. Creation, the act of producing or causing to exist, the act of creating, engendering. Creationism, the doctrine that the true story of the creation of the universe is as it is recounted in the Bible, especially in the first chapter of Genesis. Evolution, any process of formation or growth, development. A product of such development, in which that something evolved. Religion, a specific fundamental set of beliefs and practices that are agreed upon by several persons or sects, the body of persons adhering to a particular set of beliefs and practices. Religious rituals, rites for strict devotion and faithfulness. Traditionism, the doctrine that the human soul is propagated along with the body.